It was absolutely the worst day of my life. I hope I never experience anything even remotely like it ever again. On the afternoon of August 10th, 2020, an off-duty Suffolk County police officer critically injured two-year-old Reardon Cavoris. For 48 hours, I didn't know if he would ever wake up. Reardon Cavoris' story is one of eight cases that Newsday uncovered showing Nassau and Suffolk police imposed little or no discipline on officers in cases involving serious injuries or deaths. There were things out of the ordinary about how the whole case was handled. Um, things with no explanation. Newsday documented the toll. Four people dead. There's no reason he should have died. No reason. And four people seriously injured. I should have been able to have at least one person I could have depended on. Survivors and families haunted by knowing that actions or inactions by members of Long Island's two major police forces left them with physical and emotional scars. This is Newsday's investigation inside Internal Affairs. And I screamed like, what do you mean Danny died? How could Danny die? And she told me that Dana was dead. Daniel McDonnell and Daynell Simmons were mentally impaired men who stopped breathing and died after struggles with Suffolk County police. As far as you're aware, what was the police investigation into what happened? <laughs> what investigation? Officers arrested McDonnell on a misdemeanor charge. He was calm and cooperated with police. A sergeant refused to give McDonnell the medications he used to control bipolar disorder. He had a psychiatric episode. He told them from the beginning that he struggles with bipolar disorder and he needs medications. Medication was brought. He asked for it. The mother brought it in. How do you not provide it? Thirteen officers joined in extracting McDonnell from a cell and in subduing him, often chest down in a position that risked suffocation. Thirteen or fourteen individuals for one person who was in a holding cell? Never wanted to, nor have I still to this day seen the pictures, and I don't want to. Um, I mean, there was a footprint on Danny's back. <laughs> Daniel Simmons was a son and a brother. He was autistic and lived in a group home. He was severely speech delayed, where he could only answer with one word sentences. What happened that night, everyone in our facility had funnel cake. For some reason, they did not want to give Daniel the piece of funnel cake. The kid that loves to eat, and he had an episode, he was upset. Three Suffolk officers arrived to take Simmons to the hospital. An officer mentioned handcuffs. Simmons ran into another room. The officers chased and started a struggle to handcuff him behind his back. He didn't see them as someone that was there to help him. After he was handcuffed, the officers pinned Simmons to the floor for an estimated nine minutes, often in a position that risks suffocation. The medical examiner cited chest compression during a violent struggle officers placed their body weight on top of him for such a prolonged amount of time, that clearly resulted in his death. The medical examiner confirmed this. Internal Affairs filed no disciplinary charges against the officers. The police department refused to give Newsday the case report, but lawsuit testimony provided a glimpse into the IA investigation. An officer who pressed her weight on Simmons' torso after he was handcuffed behind his back testified that she was never interviewed for the departmental probe. In the McDonald case, a homicide detective found no evidence of criminal wrongdoing after interviewing the officers who helped subdue McDonald. Many of the interviews lasted for five minutes or less, according to his notes. The investigation was completely shoddy. The com period point blank. The Suffolk Internal Affairs investigation upheld 10 counts of wrongdoing, but Internal Affairs missed the 18-month deadline for filing disciplinary charges. There was no punishment. Why would that take so long to complete an Internal Affairs investigation? I can't really give you a compelling answer for that. Unit was swamped, really without an influx of personnel. Uh, it was an uphill climb.
not one single person was held accountable for any misconduct. It's, it's, it's appalling. It's appalling. If, if Danny did that to someone, he would have been held accountable, but because he's not a cop. No one had one day off. No one was suspended for a half a second. Business as usual. It's just the family that's left to pick up the pieces. Internal Affairs, or IA, is a unit within most police departments that is responsible for investigating police misconduct. In other words, IA is supposed to police the police. Michael Caldarelli commanded Suffolk's Internal Affairs Unit from 2012 to 2014. I made sergeant, then I made lieutenant, and I went to Internal Affairs as a, an investigator. In Newsday interviews, he said he was ordered to reform Internal Affairs and wound up transferred to a career-ending assignment when he tried to do just that. I guess what struck me most about it was that it was an assignment with no downtime whatsoever. You always had stuff to do. The unit did not have adequate staff. Cases were not getting done in a timely fashion. And the one quote that really stuck with me was, a decision has been made to keep internal affairs weak. Caldarelli was the only present or former Suffolk or NASA police official willing to publicly discuss any of Newsday's eight case histories. NASA Commissioner Patrick Ryder declined interview requests. Suffolk Commissioner Rodney Harrison declined or did not respond to interview requests. He issued brief written statements about two cases. The officers named in Inside Internal Affairs case histories either declined to speak on the record or did not respond to interview requests. You're watching Newsday TV's special LI Votes 2022 election coverage. I'm Faith Jesse, and it's been a very busy night. Results in Suffolk were delayed because ballots had to be driven to the Board of Elections in Yapang to be tallied. Now, this delay didn't stop Governor Hochul from being declared the winner over Long Island Congressman Lee Zeldin. Newsday TV was there as she addressed supporters. I'm not here to make history. I'm here to make a difference. And because of all of you, we'll keep making progress, breaking down barriers, breaking glass ceilings, helping New Yorkers achieve the greatness that it is capable of. And I will lead with strength and compassion, not with fear and anger. Republican challenger Lee Zeldin is not ready to concede the race. Newsday TV Sherry Einhorn continues our team coverage from the Republican campaign headquarters in Manhattan. Be patient. That is what Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin told a room full of supporters that has since emptied out. Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul may have declared victory, but Zeldin is not conceding the race. He told this crowd there are still more than a million votes from Election Day that need to be counted, including his home base of Nassau and Suffolk counties. Watch what he told his supporters. So, so what's going to happen is that over the course of uh, these next couple of hours, you're going to see the race continue to get closer and closer and closer and closer. Uh, th this includes, by the way, uh, on Long Island, you're going to see a massive victory coming out of Long Island, which will also be closing the gap. So again, as you heard, Zeldin is not conceding a race. He told his supporters that the number separating the two candidates would continue growing smaller and smaller as the hours drag on and on. That is the latest here at Zeldin headquarters in Manhattan. I'm Shari Einhorn for Newsday TV. And as we told you, the counting of votes in Suffolk County got off to a very slow start that delayed reporting on many races. Suffolk GOP Chairman Jesse Garcia explained to supporters what happened. The decision has been made that all 1,400 memory cards from each voting machine will be brought back to Yapang and uploaded 
accurately, properly, so that we have an accurate count in this election. Um, that's going to take some time, quite frankly. As I said, it's going to, you know, we've waited for the better part of almost 25, 28 years to get the results. I know that we share in wanting to get those numbers quickly, but it's best that we get them accurately. So I indulge upon you to enjoy yourself. We're here to have a party, enjoy and socialize, and the moment we have any information, we will come forward and share that with you. And from Suffolk to Nassau, we're going to the Nassau GOP where Republicans are claiming victory in several races. Newsday TV's Jill Wagner continues our team coverage. Well, a big night for Republicans here in Nassau County declaring victory in two congressional races and also three state Senate races. Let's start in Congress. We're talking about District 3 and District 4. Both of those have been in Democratic hands for years, in some cases decades. Uh, in District 3, George Santos declaring victory. He's 34 years old, um, a financier. In District 4, Anthony Diaz Bezito declaring victory. He's a Hempstead Town Council member and also a retired New York City police detective. I spoke to him a little while ago. Here's what he had to say. I think that, uh, you know, if anyone uh, in this district, you ask them, are you better off today than you were two years ago when Joe Biden took office? The answer for most of them was no. Uh, the fact that the Democrats in the state legislature and uh, really all across the country have waged war on law enforcement and law and order, it's been, uh, it's been an issue, especially here on Long Island. We saw it last year when Bruce Blakeman and Annie Donnelly uh, were elected in a, in a county that's, uh, you know, there's a lot more Democrats than there are Republicans. So I think it was just a, a combination of a lot of things. People want to change. They want to see balance in both Washington and in Albany, and that's what we're going to bring them. What's priority number one when you get to D.C.? I think priority number one is to figure out, uh, you know, everyone else that won, see where we stand uh, with the uh, House of Representatives. And on day one, uh, we continue what uh, Leader McCarthy has put forth as the uh, commitment to America. And we roll up our sleeves and get to work in a bipartisan fashion for this nation. As for the state Senate, Jack Martin, Steve Rhodes, and Patricia Canzanari Fitzpatrick all declaring victory as well. The Republicans will be holding a press conference Wednesday morning. They say to talk about their plans and priorities in D.C. and Albany. In Baldwin, Jill Wagner for Newsday TV. And we're taking you from Baldwin to Freeport. Newsday TV Cecilia Dowd spent the night at Laura Gillen's campaign headquarters, and she continues our team coverage. Well, it was a long night here at Lori Gillen's headquarters in Freeport on the Nautical Mile. It wasn't the victorious night that she was hoping for, but she has not conceded this race for Congress. She spoke briefly. Here's what she had to say. We believe that the race is too close to call. We are going to wait until every vote is counted. It's an extremely close race. There's still a lot of ballots out there. Um, we're really proud of the campaign we, run, we ran. I'm so grateful to all the people who put in so much effort on this campaign, my, my team, my family, labor, all the Moms Demand Actions. We're so grateful for your support, and we'll see what happens uh, as the votes are counted. Thank you, everybody. A campaign spokesperson tells me that there are still absentee ballots coming in and they just want to make sure every vote is counted. Again, Laura Gillen has not conceded this race, though her opponent, Republican Hempstead Town Councilman Anthony D'Esposito, has declared victory. I'm reporting from Freeport for Newsday TV, Cecilia Dowd. And now to a local race that's being watched nationally. Political newcomers Robert Zimmerman and George Santos, both vying for the third congressional district left vacant by Congressman Tom Suozzi. Zimmerman, a Democrat, was hoping for a win, but George Santos came out on top. What comes next is simple, is a rescue mission to save our country, to take back control of common sense for our youth, to deliver a quality education, to deliver honest opportunities of employment, to deliver lower cost of energy, to make America energy independent. Let's make sure that we also work on lowering taxes to make sure that people have an opportunity to thrive. 
even more important than the results of this evening is our commitment to defending our democracy and our Constitution. Yeah. Putting it above partisanship. Putting it above partisanship. In this campaign, we lead by example. So this evening, just a few moments ago, I called George Santos to congratulate him. For those of you watching, you can catch all of our coverage right here uh, at Newsday.com or on Newsday TV. Joy, thank you for coming in into the studio. You're watching Newsday TV special election night coverage. Be sure to check out our homepage, Newsday.com, for the very latest numbers from the boards of elections as they continue to update. And we're going to leave you with a sneak peek at Newsday's front page. You can check it out online. Thanks so much for watching. So word is that the hottest, spiciest, pepperiest thing that you can eat on the entire island is this unassuming chicken tender, which is a long way of saying, pray for me. Now this is a waiver that you, do you actually require that people sign this before they have the blazing? In yeah, front of and you're about to do the Reaper challenge, which is, a, I would say it's about 15 out of 10. <laughs> it's absolutely brutal. Refuse sweating, bodily injury, or even death. I'm not signing this. Can I have a lawyer? Pickin' Chicken, which opened earlier this year in Farmingdale, serves some truly terrific tenders, and also some ridiculously hot ones, tenders that get their heat from the notorious Carolina Reaper, which no less an authority than the Guinness Book has dubbed the hottest pepper in the world. There are other peppers that have been proven to be hotter, they're just not documented. One of those peppers is going to be on the chicken tenders that we're going to eat <laughs> today. Meet pepper expert Joe Lodato. His Setauket-based company, 86 Peppers, sells seeds and plants for some of the hottest and most unique peppers in the world to gardeners all over the country. When you're eating something hot and your body kicks in with that stress response, you have the endorphins, you have um, the pain, and you have a little bit of anxiety and fear all mixed in to provide an adventurously addictive experience. This is like intimidation. I feel like, yeah, he's psyching us out. Is there, one's than the is there plutonium in those or what? Like, what's happening? See, what's nerve wracking about this is that, like, he actually is nervous. Wait, like, which one would you attack? That guy looks that like it's, like, there's a lot of powder on it. I'd probably go with. But you don't want that. Right. Yeah. So, before you see this next part, I want to warn you that some of the images that you're about to see may be disturbing, particularly for younger viewers. Cut. Dignity. Good, Let's yeah. cut till we get to the dignity. Where's those shakes at? What about the dairy? What's hey, happening? Hey, where's the fire extinguisher? <laughs> Medic, lawyer, someone. <laughs> That's hot. That is really hot. That is not for the How faint of heart. You're saying that? Yeah. You know what? What's going on here? This is one of those. I'm a serious food critic, okay? She wouldn't voluntarily keep going. No, not really. I'm only doing this for you, Scott. <laughs> I gotta say, there are days when mine really is the best job in the world. And then there are days like this. I've completely lost any sense of what we're doing here. A major update in a case that's outraged many Long Islanders. Michael Valva was just sentenced to the maximum of 25 years to life in prison for murdering his son. The details of the case were so shocking, the judge became emotional. An eight-year-old boy who right now should be getting excited for Christmas is dead. I speak to everybody out there. We can never let this happen again. And that's all I'll say from this bench. <clears throat> Consistent with the recommendation of the probation department, the court hereby sentences the defendant to an indeterminate sentence, the minimum being 25 years, 
the maximum being the remainder of his natural life. Prosecutors say Valva and his former fiance kept eight-year-old Thomas in an unheated garage during the winter of January of 2020. The boy died of hypothermia. During the trial, some of the boy's teachers testified Thomas often came to school hungry and bruised. Valva had this to say in court just before he was sentenced. Sorry. I'm truly sorry. I am regretful, ashamed, heartbroken, and grief stricken standing here beside before you, having contributed to the death of my son Thomas. I love Thomas with all my heart, as I still love Anthony and Andrew. Never in my worst nightmare would I imagine being responsible for Thomas's death. Angela Polina Velva's former fiance is also facing a murder charge. She's expected to stand trial in February. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Medina Simulmata. Things started to get exciting. People wanted to talk to him and people wanted to know more about his story. I knew about him, but I didn't know that that's what happened to him. Dunia Sibomana. Dunia Sibomana. Dunia Sibomana. I'm Dunia Sibomana. Dunia Sibomana was born in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which run alongside Virunga National Park. When I was in Congo, I didn't really have much. It's an area known for natural resources and diverse wildlife. In my village, we had to use flashlights at night or build a fire to keep us warm. It was difficult finding food. He had to be so independent over there in Congo. He had to be responsible for so much at such a young age. I think when I came here, it was like a whole new life. It was a whole new start. Sibomana was brought to the U.S. through a program called Smile Rescue Fund. This is a nonprofit foundation that I started a few years ago for children with facial, severe facial deformities. And he was temporarily fostered by Jennifer Crean while he began reconstructive surgeries. After years in the foster system, he had a chance encounter with the Rodriguez family. We first met Dunia August 23rd, 2016, when uh, Miguel was buying breakfast one morning and Cliff Scudin, who runs the amazing uh, surf camp here, said, you have to meet this boy. She fell in love with him from, from day one. Miguel and I were told that we would never be able to have children. When the opportunity came of um, giving our love in, a, in, a, in an opportunity to a child that doesn't have his parents, um, that that was a blessing. Many are surprised by Sibomana. He doesn't act like other kids who have experienced certain traumas. He had already lost his mother to malaria, and then playing in the forests at the age of six, Sibomana's life violently changed course. The father was working in a field, and the three children, um, him and his little brother, were in the distance a little bit playing, and then three chimpanzees came up on them and attacked them. The little brother was killed. During the attack, uh, he had his upper lip and his lower lip um, ripped off his ear. He lost one finger. He takes that trauma and turns it into amazing experiences and conversations and jokes even, which blow my mind. <laughs> so we made a joke about the finger. So. Sometimes we'll go to a classroom and we'll, we'll joke, you know, about numbers. You know, give me five, give me four. Okay, Daniel, let's go. How much is five plus four? Oh, nine. <laughs> so we make a joke about every ten just to get by. We 
all sleeping. She's up in the gym, working out at five o'clock in the morning. Denise is coachable. A lot of times, you know, you could have a kid, but if he's not coachable or, he, or he's not in the moment, he's he's not going to remember anything that we told him. This kid is a sponge. He takes everything. He remembers everything. He was staying with us on weekends. So on weekends is when we travel with the wrestling team. Miguel Rodriguez, known to many as Coach Rodriguez, trained Isaiah Bird, a young wrestler born without legs. Watching Bird's success with wrestling despite his missing limbs inspired Subamana to take an interest. Uh, we will take him to wrestling, to a wrestling tournament, just to watch. Little by little, he started coming to practice here and there. And then we signed him up to a tournament and he did okay. And then we signed him up, up, signed him up for another tournament and he did better. And we were like, all right, you know, he's, uh, he's getting really good at this uh, wrestling thing. Since moving from the forests of the Congo to a beach town on Long Island, Subomana learned English, had undergone many intense surgeries, and most recently, he's become something of a wrestling phenom. Dunia Subomana come up to the state wrestling championships here at the MVP Arena in Albany, and he has been a fan favorite. As he kept winning, match after match after match, you could feel the energy change. Everyone just exploded. Subomana is now a wrestling champion at the age of 14. I was just so excited that I won it. Uh, we've been practicing backflips since like we were in quarantine, so I was like, this is my moment. Greg Sarah with Newsday TV and the New York State champion at 102 pounds. It's going to be Subomania on Long Island. How does that sound? Awesome. After years in the Forster system, on October 19, 2019, Subomana became a permanent U.S. resident, and the Rodriguez family officially filed for a domestic adoption. He's got this spark about him, and he doesn't let what happened to him stop him from living his life. Happy birthday to you. While the long adoption process played out, the Rodriguez family had surprising news. Marissa was pregnant. She gave birth to Stella Rodriguez on July 5th, 2021. I gained two kids in one year. That's what I tell people. <laughs> Dunia is the best big brother Stella could ask for. That nurturing feeling, that feeling of wanting to care for others, I think was ingrained in him before he even got here. Dania is a very confident young man. And I think that from day one, we, um, we put in his head that, you know, that he was meant to be that way and that God has him in here looking that way for a reason. You know, that, that, that he has a job in life and that he will inspire people later on. I thought I was just gonna be a regular kid, but that's not what happened. <laughs> 